one third from academia and one third from uh, industries. And, and also the 60% is from US registered and 40% is from South Korea. And so it, I, I'm very happy. We uh, have a lot of uh, interest from US and South Korea. And uh, I, I really hope this forum is a great start to communicate to countries uh, more freely. I think you should uh, mention that at the to everybody because people may want to know who participating. Yeah, maybe at the end or when is a good time? When, I think when you, when you give <laughs> introductory <laughs> remark, maybe you can just oh. mention briefly. Okay. I think uh, people may want to know who are participating. Oh yeah, so it's a good good kind of a summary statistics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Nah, I'm ready. Oh, great. All right, so seven o'clock, should I start? Uh, right now we have 41. So is it okay to wait uh, one one more minute? Or what about Jihyun? Is it, do you need more time to allow other people? People keep coming in. So I try mm -hmm. to admit it as soon as possible. So maybe wait two, two, three more minutes then. I don't know, it's up to Jihyun. Uh, do you finish the admit everybody so far, right now? So far, yes. Okay, and then and can... if people keep coming, I'll, I'll keep let people join. So mm -hmm. it's seven o'clock, so we I think that we can start. Okay, uh, yeah. I'll start. Good morning in Korea and good evening in the United States. I'm Jin Barnaby, a president of KY's Washington DC chapter. Thank you for joining us to the KY's forum series. KY's Korean Woman in Science and Engineering is a non-profit organization of Korean American woman professional in science and engineering field. Today, we have invited two internationally renowned infectious disease experts from South Korea and the United States and asked them to share their views on infectious disease, in particular on COVID-19 research and development. This event is sponsored by Korea Foundation, a non-profit public diplomacy organization established in 1991 to promote a better understanding of Korea and strengthen friendship in the international community. We will start our forum with opening remark by the president of KY's NIH chapter and a chair of KY's forum series, Dr. Dong Hyun Kim. Welcome to the KY's forum on COVID-19 research in the US and South Korea. COVID-19 pandemic is perhaps the greatest challenge in our time. To meet this challenge, medical researchers and health professionals all over the world have joined forces in finding ways to detect, treat, and vaccinate against this terrible disease. To contribute this global effort, the Korean American Women in Science and Engineering, NIH DC chapter, jointly organized this research forum on COVID-19, sponsored by the Korea Foundation. In today's inaugural event, we have invited two experts of international fame, Dr. Yang Mi Ji from South Korea and Dr. Connie Shmarjan from the US to share their experience in COVID-19 research with us today. Let me talk a bit about KYS. It is a nonprofit organization in US. Established in 2004, KYS has 800 members in eight chapters across the US, including LA, NIH, and Washington DC. The vast majority of members have advanced degrees in science and engineering, and they are active researchers in their fields. Due to geographical considerations, most activities such as annual symposium and mentoring sessions are run by chapters. In addition, NIH and DC chapters have focused on collaboration with other professional organizations in Korea and US, 
ranging from hosting monthly research webinars with Korea women scientists and engineers to STEM activities for next generations, such as Florence Nightingale Day with American Statistical Associations and Caucus for Women in Statistics. I hope you enjoy today's outstanding presentations and discussion. Thank you. And let me introduce Dr. Lee. Dr. Gun Lee is the president of the Korea Foundation. Prior to joining Korea Foundation, Dr. Lee was professor of international politics at Seoul National University's Graduate School of International Studies. He has conducted over 20 years of research on Korea foreign affairs and international exchanges and served as an advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Dr. Lee received a PhD in political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Please welcome Dr. Lee. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kim, uh, for your kind and nice introduction. Uh, uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how many men are joining us, but uh, good morning to everyone joining us from Korea and good evening to our friends in the US. Uh, as president of the Korea Foundation, uh, it is my great pleasure to sponsor the KY's forum series on COVID-19 research in the US and South Korea. Uh, I'm honored to be participating in the first event today. Uh, let me begin by briefly introducing the Korea Foundation or uh, KF. Uh, the KF is a not-for-profit independent organization affiliated with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with a mission uh, to promote better understanding of Korea in the international community and foster global friendship. Uh, so far, the KF uh, has largely focused on promoting uh, Korean studies at overseas universities and think tanks, as well as on invitation programs and cultural exchanges with many countries around the globe. However, this unprecedented uh, pandemic-induced crisis has required us to think bigger, uh, widening our view and pursuing greater collaboration uh, and dialogue in the field of public health and science in addition to our traditional uh, programs. Uh, we are dedicated to promoting uh, such a dialogue as one method of tackling this tremendous global issue in collaboration with other countries. Uh, the KF is happy to share Korea's transparent and scientific response uh, to COVID-19, uh, learn from others' experiences and discuss global health issues in the long run. Uh, in, the, in the long term, in the long run, in the long term. Uh, throughout this year, uh, the KF has organized or sponsored many webinars on COVID-19 in cooperation with think tanks and universities across the United States. Uh, however, today represents our first time working with a scientific group uh, like KYS, uh, which is comprised of hundreds of experts in the field and we are indeed delighted to support this meaningful uh, discussion. Uh, we have some excellent panels to start off this forum series. Uh, I look forward to hearing the insights of Dr. Uh, Young Mi Ji, uh, whom I have been fortunate uh, to work with since April of this year, after she was appointed as the KF's Special Representative for Health Diplomacy. It is also a great honor to have the US top expert uh, in infectious diseases, Dr. Uh, Connie Schmaljohn. Uh, incidentally, I was delighted to learn that she was a former president of the uh, International Soci Society of Hunter Viruses, which were first discovered by a Korean virologist, uh, Dr. Ho Wang Lee, uh, who happens to be my father. Uh, and I hope today's event will help us better understand the way the pandemic proliferated as well as what strategies can be taken uh, to flatten uh, the recurring curves in the world. In closing, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all our invited guests and experts for coming together here and now. In particular, my appreciation goes out to all the members of KYS for your devotion, passion, and expertise in making this forum possible. Uh, through cooperative efforts like today's dialogue, I am certain we can turn the challenges of COVID-19 into opportunities. Thank you very much. 
Uh, before I introduce our speaker, let me briefly talk about today's agenda. We will have 30 minutes talk by, by two speakers and Q&A session will be held after both present presentations are complete. So please type your questions or comments for the speakers into the chat box. Then Dr. Park, who is the moderator, will share your comments and questions with the speakers during the Q&A session. Let me introduce our first speaker. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Young Mi Ji, who is going to talk to us about infectious disease R&D in Korea. Dr. Young Mi Ji is the special advisor to the prime minister in health and special representative for health diplomacy, Korea Foundation. She received her MD from Seoul National University Medical School and a PhD in virology from University of London. Dr. Ji has broad experience in collaborating with WHO and international public health partners. Currently, she is a member of the WHO International Health Regulation Emergency Committee on COVID-19 and a member of the WHO Scientific Advisory Group for the Blueprint on Research and Development Preparedness for Epidemics. From 2007 to 2014, Dr. Ji worked for the expanded program on immunization in the WHO Western Pacific region. And from 2014 to 2019, she served as a director general of the Center for Infectious Disease Research of Korea Centers for Disease Control and led various international activities, including the WHO Korea Joint Mission on MERS outbreak in 2015, and the WHO International Health Regulation Joint External Evaluation, JEE, on National Public Health Emergency Response Capacity in 2017. And as a result, she received the President Medal of Distinguished Service in 2017. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Ji. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to the uh, KY's forum today. Uh, it is my great privilege to share the um, infectious disease R&D situation, including uh, COVID-19 research in Korea with you. So let me just uh, share my slide with you. So uh, the outline of my talk uh, will be infectious disease R&D strategies and infrastructure uh, in Korea. Uh, and I will talk about uh, some COVID-19 research at the global level and also in my country. And I want to introduce some publications of COVID-19 research by Korean uh, researchers and summary. So after swine flu uh, pandemic it, in 2009, the Korean government started to invest more on flu research and established the first national R&D plan for responding to emergencies from infectious diseases as a five year plan. And then MERS came in 2015. Uh, so a government um, established second uh, R&D plan to, to invest more on uh, emerging infectious diseases. So second plan includes uh, 10 areas, uh, such as one health uh, concept, antimicrobial resistance, and genetic diseases, and climate change related vector borne diseases, uh, such as uh, severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome, SFTS, and tuberculosis and influenza. So in that plan, we have three categories and 10 areas of uh, the R&D plan for responding to emergencies. So first category is to secure responding to emerging and new and imported infectious diseases, such as emerging and unknown infectious diseases, cli climate change related infectious diseases, genotic uh, diseases, uh, and influenza. Second category is strengthening capacity to address chronic and uns unsolved infectious diseases, uh, such as multi-drug resistant bacteria, tuberculosis, and chronic uh, infectious diseases such as HIV or viral hepatitis. And third category is to build a national safety net against infectious diseases that include preparedness and management for the infectious disease disasters, 
and vaccine preventable diseases and vaccines and bioterrorism. So to implement those national R&D plan, government also formed the Forum for Infectious Disease Research in 2012. So this is a coalition of eight government ministries for the infectious disease research and development. And this provides a venue for the open discussions among around 200 experts from academia, industries, scientists, and government. So this is basically public and private um, partnership. So if you see the government investment for the infectious disease R&D uh, from 2013 to 2017, you can see how much has been invested for each area for, for basic science, therapeutics, research, and vaccines and diagnostics, surveillance and control, the strategy and guidance and infrastructure. So in total, it's around uh, 900 million US dollars for, uh, for five years. Then uh, government launched the first uh, kind of government-wide R&D fund for the infectious disease research, GFID, in 2018 as a five-year plan. So uh, eight in this uh, fund, eight ministries are participating for preparedness for importation of new and emerging diseases, uh, including the um, disease surveillance and monitoring, modeling, and information collection and database. And also for the field response, um, uh, developing multi-antigen screening test kit and, and, and personal protective equipment and also risk communication and, and ICT-based monitoring of self-quarantine people. So this fund is basically uh, uh, for, the, for the field response uh, research. The second uh, government-wide uh, um, initiative is for the antimicrobial resistant research based on One Health concept. This is also a five-year plan uh, that was launched in 2019. So different ministries are also participating in this uh, fund. Uh, and you can see that, that not only humans, but also animals and food and the environment, the sector should be involved in this um, research project. Then uh, the, the Ministry of Health and Welfare launched the, uh, I think this is probably the biggest infectious disease R&D uh, launched by the Ministry of Health and Welfare. The, this was uh, launched in uh, actually this year as a 10 year plan with the 570 billion US dollars for vaccines and diagnostics and therapeutics. And so you can see what has been uh, included in the list for the vaccines. So that uh, that's next generation uh, back, uh, TB, tuberculosis and universal flu and SFTS, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, and inactivated Japanese encephalitis and hepatitis A and hand foot mouse disease, norovirus and DTIP combination vaccine. And you can also see what has been selected for the diagnostics and therapeutics. And also we have a research investment for Global Health uh, Technology Fund uh, this is for the global uh, initiative. Uh, this is a rather innovative uh, funding mechanism uh, following the model of GHIT in Japan. So Korean government, the Ministry of Health and Welfare is supporting 50% of the fund and 25% is supported by Bill Gates um, Foundation and then another 25 by Korean companies. So this is five year plan, but hopefully this can be, uh, that can be ex extended. So if you see the portfolio of right fund for 2020, you can see what uh, has been selected as a project for the vaccine and therapeutics, and also diagnostics and digital health. And that those uh, um, projects selected in 2020 for COVID-19 are indicated in red box. And also another ministry, Ministry of Science and ICT, has launched the Center for Convergence Research of Emerging Virus Infection in 2017. So there are four areas in this uh, center. So, so uh, diagnostics, vaccines, therapeutics, and modeling. So they have uh, 
different teams from different institutions under the Ministry of Science, and they are working in, in one same um, building. And they are targeting the, the commercialization of those products uh, from the research. And also in uh, Korea, NIH Vaccine Research Center has been established actually this year with a vision of National Control Tower for Vaccine R&D with uh, three missions. So articulating policy for vaccine R&D and coordinating uh, the vaccine R&D for national immunization program and bioterrorism and supporting new vaccine re research uh, and shaping the research ag agenda. So there are four main areas for, for uh, the focus. Uh, the vaccines for the em emerging infections uh, with priorities for preparing for epidemic and national immunization program vaccines to increase vaccine self-sufficiency in, in the program and, and bioterrorism preparedness and next generation vaccines. So in addition to the vaccine research center uh, within Korea and I also Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, has uh, the vaccine R&D as I explained earlier and also other ministries and funders are supporting the vaccine R&D. So for example, if you see the last category, this is private sector driving public private partnership. Uh, here uh, we have live Japanese encephalitis vaccine, IPV, the inactivated polio vaccine and virus and MMR. So the, uh, IPV is actually the um, global part of global polio eradication initiative in collaboration with um, WHO. So LG CAM is involved in this uh, IPB production, IPB development and production. And also this, this year, uh, Korea CDC has been upgraded to Korea Disease Control Agency and also National Infectious Disease Research Institute has been newly established within Korea NIH. But this Korea NIH is, is on, under the umbrella of Korea CDC. So I will explain that uh, issue later. Uh, unlike US, we uh, have uh, different systems. So Korea NIH is located under the umbrella of Korea CDC. So Korea Infectious Disease Research Institute is uh, within NIH, but it's still uh, umbrella under the umbrella of Korea CDC. So in that uh, res research institute, uh, there are three centers. So Emerging Virus Research Center, Infectious Disease uh, Research Center, and Vaccine Research Center. So for the first one, Emerging Virus Infectious, infe uh, the Research Center uh, is focusing on various viruses. Second one is mainly for the bacterial disease, genetic disease research, and also antimicrobial resistance. And the last one for the Vaccine Research Center. Uh, and also Ministry of Science and ICT has some uh, centers for the infectious disease research, as I explained earlier, a SEVI Center for Infectious Disease. Um, um, uh, SEVI is located in CRIP, but in addition to that, uh, they, they on, also have uh, an, another uh, Center for Infectious Disease Research and also the um, CRIT, um, the Korea Research Institute of Chemical uh, Technology have uh, the SEVI, um, I explained earlier. And also they have newly established, like uh, Korea NIH, they have established Korea uh, Virus Research Institute. Uh, this is the new one. It, this is uh, located in Institute for the Basic Science. And then let me briefly introduce some uh, infrastructure for health research in Korea and NIH. Um, so we do have a BL3 facility, uh, including animal BL3 that has been established in 2011 and also biobank that was built in 2012. And I believe this is probably the uh, biggest biobank in Asia. And Dr. Francis Collins visited this uh, facility earlier and he, I think he quite liked it. And, uh, Korean, uh, and National Center for Medical Information and Knowledge. And also we have a Biosafety Level 4 lab, uh, which was built in 2016. And then uh, the Center for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine in, in 2016. 
And, and also we have a medical insectarium built in 2014. The newest one is Vaccine Research Center, as, as I mentioned, and uh, is built in 2020 this year. And next year, we are expecting to have independent uh, building for the um, National Culture Collection for Pathogen NCCP. We also have some global initiatives for, for infectious disease R&D. Um, so we do have International Vaccine Institute, IVI. So Korean government is the biggest funder for IVI. And also we have support from uh, Swedish and Indian and Finnish government as well as Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, IVI is promoting vaccine diplomacy, especially during this COVID-19 crisis. And it has a success story of the um, WH pre-qualified cholera vaccine. This is produced by the uh, one small uh, company called U-Biologics, and this has been used uh, globally for, for co cholera control. And also we do have Institute Pasteur Korea, IPK, supported by the Ministry of Science and ICT. Uh, and this has high throughput drug, drug uh, screening platform and focusing on therapeutics research uh, on virus and tuberculosis and neglected tropical disease and AMO. And also we have right fund at uh, the innovative mechanism I, I explained, uh, supported by by the uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare and, and Gates and some other pharmaceuticals. And then Ministry of Science and ICT is, is participating in Globid, uh, and this is the, uh, the funder network, uh, mainly driven by European countries. And let me briefly explain the uh, global initiative for the uh, COVID-19 research. So um, after WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Chadros declared public health emergency of international con concern on January 30th, uh, WHO has been um, facilitating research on COVID-19. So Global Research and Innovative Forum was held in February and, and the uh, research a roadmap for COVID-19 has been produced in March. So in that roadmap, uh, it has two goals. So one is to facilitate various research on COVID-19, but another goal, B, is to support the research priorities that can lead to the development of sustainable uh, research platform uh, that can be used for next disease X epidemic. So in that uh, roadmap, there are nine uh, areas. So nine working group has been uh, formed for each uh, subject. So nine areas include epidemiological study, uh, infection prevention and control, including healthcare workers and clinical management and therapeutics and vaccines, uh, and virus natural history and diagnostics, and animal environment and human interface. And also you can see two other cross-cutting areas um, uh, such as ethical considerations and social science. So in terms of COVID-19 research, uh, there has been some uh, research project uh, uh, launched as intramural research and also extramural research. So intramural research include a therapeutics uh, and vaccines project. You can see what um, project has been included there. And also as extramural research, uh, diagnostics and cohort. And this is immunological analysis of confirmed cases, confirmed the patient uh, for at least two years. And the vaccines uh, develop immun immunological assay and evaluation method and therapeutics such as monoclonal antibody development. And government also formed interministerial national task force uh, to support COVID-19 research in June. So basically two ministries, um, the major ministries for, for this TF. So Ministry of Health and Welfare, of course, and the Ministry of Science and ICT. So, um, so it, it has three categories, vaccine and therapeutics and medical equipment. So for vac vaccines, we have around 12 candidates under development. Uh, government is supporting uh, uh, three, uh, uh, among them three um, studies. So three uh, uh, are in clinical trials. 
including one subunit protein and two DNA uh, vaccines. Uh, for the, the therapeutics 19 uh, in clinical trial as of November 23, uh, and five in clinical phase one and 10 in phase two, four in phase three. So among them, the plasma antibody uh, that is uh, developed by Green Cross that is in phase two in monoclonal antibody, two are in phase three. So one is Korean company called Celtrion, another one by a US company, really. And then there are various uh, drug positioning studies, including asthma drug and pancreatitis drug and parasite drug. And also government selected 11 key supplies as medical equipment to, to respond to uh, emerging infectious diseases. So let me uh, introduce some of the publication uh, by Korean researchers. So the first one is contact tracing uh, during the outbreak. Uh, this is uh, data collected from January 20 uh, to March 27. So uh, the, um, the research group followed the 59,000 uh, contacts of 5,700 uh, index patients. And out of those contacts, um, uh, more than 10,000 household contacts and uh, 48,000 non-household contacts were compared and they, they compared the, the infection rate on household contacts and non-household contacts. So they found that the 11.8% of household contacts were uh, infected. Among non-household contacts, only 1.9% uh, were contacted. So use of personal protective measures and social distancing, even within the uh, household is important. So next uh, table shows some more details. So you can see the, how different uh, those infection rate uh, among different age group here. So you, if you compare the age group, you can see the age group of uh, 10 to 19 years old has highest uh, household transmission rate followed by 70s and uh, 60s. So as I mentioned, implementation of those uh, public health recommendations, including hand and respiratory hygiene, uh, should be encouraged to reduce the uh, transmission within affected household. Then uh, next one is the, um, the evidence of long distance um, droplet transmission of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 by direct airflow in uh, a restaurant in Korea. So, so this is very interesting uh, study. So there were one infector and two pe people, two, two persons were infected from this infected within uh, uh, in, in this restaurant. Uh, if, if you see the time overlap between those three people, uh, for case A uh, and case B, they only had uh, five minutes overlapping time uh, between two people. And for case two and C, only 21 minutes. If you see the distance um, when, when uh, where they were sitting, uh, for case A and B, they were sitting uh, at actually 6.5 meter apart. For case B and C, they were sitting 4.8 meter apart, so quite far. It's not within a two, two meters distance. So the conclusion of this uh, uh, study uh, was the droplet trans transmission can occur at a distance greater than two, meter, two meters if there is direct airflow from an infected person. So this was quite interesting uh, result. And another, um, uh, the, Good example I want to show you um, is that the impact, big impact of the uh, wearing mask. Uh, so there was an outbreak in Paju, at least uh, 70 uh, people were linked to the uh, one Starbucks uh, in Paju. So 27 people were directly infected from one guest who stayed for 2.5 hours without wearing mask. And then the, another 43 were infected uh, by second and third or fourth, fourth generation spread. 
So importantly, customers were not wearing face, face masks and there was poor, poor ventilation inside the store, but none of the employees were infected because all were wearing the mask. Another, uh, the publication uh, of the um, study on the air and environmental contamination caused by COVID-19 patients. So they, they actually collected uh, air samples and environmental samples uh, and they, they, they did a PCR and they um, found that all air samples were negative for the for the PCR, but there was widespread surface contamination. So 89 out of 320, actually 27% were PCR positive. So their conclusion was uh, uh, the air, air trans, urban transmission uh, from hospitalized um, patient is uncommon, but the surface contamination was widespread. And they found the, the a room uh, which was routinely cleaned with disinfectant wipe was quite um, clean. But if you just use spray as a disinfectant, it, 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 it uh, actually doesn't really work as a disinfectant uh, if you just spray it. So you have to really wipe the, the surface. And then uh, this is actually publication by uh, US NIH. And I was quite uh, impressed by this model. So just want to um, just remind you of this model. So, so this active model is for, for the for facilitating vaccine development. Uh, this is basically public private partnership uh, for harmonized clinical trial to, to accelerate um, the research. And uh, so various uh, the candidate vaccines with different platforms uh, can use common IRB and common cr cross trial data safety monitoring board and a central lab. Uh, and this has been proposed by the US NIH, and I think this was really fascinating idea. And I hope that this could be also established in my own country, but I think it, it, it didn't happen. But anyway, uh, th th I suppose this has been actively ongoing in, in US NIH, and hopefully that kind of mechanism can be also um, uh, launched in my country for, for, for the future. <laughs> Then I want to give you some uh, example of collaboration between US NIH and Korea NIH. And uh, it was re uh, related to uh, uh, Moscow, uh, at Mo Moscow um, research to develop monoclonal antibody using Korean uh, Moscow patients. So uh, Korean uh, research team learned the um, method of rapid antibody platform technology from the um, we are the, uh, the experts in, in US NIH to isolate single B cells containing monoclonal antibody for um, Moscow virus. So this ha method has been uh, used for some other viruses such as SFTS, a severe fever with, with thrombocytopenia syndrome, and also uh, COVID-19. So as a summary, the infectious disease research in Korea is led by two main ministries, uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare and Ministry of Science and ICT. And uh, the new um, the establishment of National Infectious Disease Research Institute within uh, Korea NIH and um, Virus Research Center uh, within the uh, IBS uh, hopefully can really facilitate the infectious disease research in Korea. And also the, for the vaccine research, uh, vaccine research center in uh, Korea and I will um, will coordinate all those vaccine uh, national vaccine research. And as I mentioned, that uh, the uh, government switched some of the project, the previous project, to COVID nineteen research to develop vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics, and also launched new project on clinical and epidemiological and also serial prevalence study and cohort study and to develop diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, and medical equipment. So um, government will continue to support developing vaccines and therapeutics while purchasing the vaccines from foreign companies and through COVAX mechanism. 
Actually, yesterday, government announced the uh, purchasing AstraZeneca vaccines. We don't know how, how many uh, uh, doses, but uh, anyway, this was the first announcement from the government to purchase COVID-19 vaccine. And prompt uh, emergency use authorization of uh, COVID-19 the testing kits in early February uh, by uh, Korea FDA uh, enabled three, three T standard strategies of um, COVID-19 response, um, testing, uh, uh, tracing, and treatment. In terms of testing, the positive rate is around 1% in Korea. For countries with high instance of infection, actually this can be very high, uh, such as 20% to, to 50%. So this was possible because of uh, the emergency use authorization. And government is trying to continuously revise the national guidance for COVID-19 uh, based on findings from epidemiological investigation and, and uh, studies uh, that include mask, use of facial mask and social distancing. So um, this is my last slide and with a uh, fast moving pandemic, no one is safe. We all know no one is safe unless everyone is safe. And, uh, we must come together globally and fund our ex exit strategy from this pandemic. And hopefully uh, we, the women scientists from uh, US and uh, Korea can work together to lead the research uh, to exit this pandemic through science. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Dr. G, for your informative talk. Uh, as I said earlier, we will have a Q&A section after the second talk, so we will move to the second speaker right away. Okay, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Connie Schmaljan, who is going to talk to us about COVID-19 studies at the NIAID Integrated Research Facility. Dr. Shmaljon is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, NIAID, Integrated Research Facility at Frederick, Maryland. She received her bachelor's degree in microbiology from the University of Nebraska and a PhD in virology from Colorado State University. Before joining NIAID Integrated Research Facility, she was a senior research scientist for medical defenses against infectious disease threat for the US Army and directed a research program at the US Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, USA MRIID. She has served on interagency public health emergency medical countermeasure enterprise, PHEMCE, viral hemorrhagic fevers IPT, and the Board of Scientific Counselor for the NIAID Vaccine Research Center, as well as the Scientific Advisory Council for the Coalition of Emergency Preparedness Innovations. She was elected to the American Acad Academy of Microbiology in 2007 and was selected as a fellow of the International Society for Vaccines in 2015. She received the Order of Military Merit and the Association of Military Surgeons of the United States Research Award in 2002 and the Presidential Rank Award in 2017. Please join me in welcoming our second speaker, Dr. Shmuel John. And am I able to share my screen now? I think I need yes, to- Yes, please, go. yes. <laughs> nope, that's not me. Uh, Dr. Lee, could you? Uh, Dr. Shimajan, you should be able to- uh... Okay, yes, now I can. Okay. And I hope you can see it. I will put it in full mode in just a second, but I've got, there's just something I've taken a minute to do first. I am so excited to be meeting Dr. Gyun Lee, the son of Professor Lee Ho Wang, who has been a friend of mine for many, many, many years. He, I have so many happy memories of meeting with him throughout the world. And I have mementos from many of those meetings in this office I'm sitting at. And I just have to show you two of them. 
if you can see me, this is a book that Professor Lee Hawang gave me in 2012 when I visited him in Seoul. And you can probably read what it says, but I couldn't. So he wrote on the inside of it for me, to dear Connie, the title is Lee Hawang, the life of a great man for children in Korean. And it's signed uh, with compliments and love, Hawang Lee. And the second thing I have that is memorable, uh, Professor Lee Ho Wong started the International Society of Hantaviruses, and this was from the very first meeting in Seoul in uh, 1989, which I attended. So anyway, this was a nice surprise and a happy surprise, and thank you for introducing yourself, Dr. Yun Lee. So I could talk about Professor Lee all day long, but that isn't why you invited me here, so I am going to move on to what I'm supposed to talk about. And I will put this in uh, presenter mode. I hope that worked for you all. So if anybody, is it sharing okay? Can somebody tell me? Yes. Okay, great. All righty. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers, particularly Dr. Jihoon Lee, for inviting me to speak to you today about the work that we're doing on COVID-19 at the NIAID Integrated Research Facility. I figure that many of you would not be familiar with the NIAID Integrated Research Facility, so I'm going to start with a very brief introduction about our facility, our mission, and our research focus. The IRF Frederick is part of the Division of Clinical Research for the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is one of the institutes, as you know, at NIH. Our division director is Dr. Clifford Lane. And this illustration shows how projects are developed at the IRF from concept through implementation. The IRF is a collaborative research facility open to government, industry, and academic partners. Projects are developed by an IRF scientist and an extramural collaborator. If the project is approved, the collaborator's expenses are limited only to the purchase of animals for the experiments and if there are any non-standard specialty reagents. Otherwise, we are a national resource and we fully support the studies. And you can find more information about the facility, the scientists, and how to work with us at our newly launched website, which is uh, shown in this link. This is a schematic of our containment laboratory space, which is on one of the floors of our three-story building. We have 11,000 square feet of biosafety level four laboratory space, eight non-human primate holding rooms, two small animal rooms, two necropsy suites. And in another part of this floor, in the floor below, we have 22,000 square feet of level two supporting space. Among the most unique of our capabilities is the high quality imaging that we're able to do and by the team led by Dr. Ji Hyun Lee. Among the equipment we have are computed tomography CT, positron emission tomography or PET, single positron emission tomography or SPECT, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI and micro PET CT. And some of the images that were taken using some of these equipment is shown below. Our imaging equipment is located both in the hot side, BSL-4 laboratories, as well as in the cold. It extends through the wall. So any manipulations that need to be done with animals with viruses in the level four lab is contained. And when the animal needs to be imaged, it's put onto one of these conveyors where it can go through the wall into the imaging equipment. And this is in the cold side of the building. We have on some of the pieces of equipment tubes that are um, clear so that the investigators can view the animals in the cold side. And there's also a big control room with screens for viewing imaging. And this is how it actually looks. On the right, you see somebody working in the level four laboratory with an animal that's been placed onto the imaging uh, conveyor. a new uh, MicroPET CT, which has allowed us for the first time to be able to image in high definition these smaller species such as mice, guinea pigs, and ferrets. Another unique capability of the IRF Frederick is our aerobiology work. 
We can make small to large particle aerosols, and we're able to incorporate respiratory inductive plethysmography, which is a method of evaluating pulmonary ventilation in our animal experiments. So from left to right, you see deposition of small to large particles in airways of an animal. And obviously the small particles go deeper, the large particles stay in the upper respiratory tract. So this aerosol deposition based on our aerosol particle size provides us with relevant modeling of human exposure to different types of aerosolized viruses. And the aerosolization equipment as shown on the right there is contained within a class three biosafety hood. So inside that hood is BSL-4, but the operators are on the outside in BSL-2 and access the equipment through these glove ports. The NIAID IRF research focus can be divided into four parts. First is developing animal models for biodefense and emerging viral pathogens such as Ebola in Marburg, Lassa, Nipa, MERS, and SARS coronavirus. We then use those animal models to test medical countermeasures, that is vaccines and therapeutics. We also work with partners to identify mechanisms of pathogenesis with an emphasis on the use of our unique imaging and aerosolization capabilities. We also have an outbreak response group that supports clinical studies in outbreak settings, such as during the Ebola outbreaks in Africa. As for most of you, probably since March, almost all of our studies have focused on SARS-CoV-2, which will be the topic of the research portion of my talk. So just to summarize some of the SARS COV-2 work that we've done at the IRF since March. We've done in vitro work such as high throughput live virus neutralization assays, antiviral compound testing, ELISAs to different parts of the SARS uh, proteins of the vir viral particles, and produce large and small particle aerosol aerosols and characterize those. In vivo, we've developed monkey models, hamster models, and then have used these models to uh, evaluate the efficacy of antibodies in, well, in the hamster model. And I'm going to be talking uh, in the rest of this talk today about the high throughput live virus assays and parts of the modeling and assessment work that we have done. So I'm gonna begin with the high throughput live virus neutralization assays. SASA was developed to support NIH's clinical trials of human convalescent plasma being used to treat COVID-19 patients. At the IRF, we received de-identified convalescent COVID-19 patient sera or plasma for testing. We determined neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in the samples using a method that we developed called fluorescent reduction neutralization assay or FRNA. Our readout is from counting about 4,000 cells per well. Titers of greater than 40 are reported and the IRF can screen approximately 100 to 125 samples per day. For this assay, the antibody sample is first mixed with virus in solution, and then that is incubated for one hour at 37 degrees, then transferred to a plates containing cell cultures. After incubation for 24 hours, these cells are fixed and stained. The first staining is with a rabbit monoclonal antibody, the SARS nucleocapsid protein. Secondary staining is alexaflor, goat anti-rabbit, and that stains these fluorescent red. They're also stained with a blue nucleic acid stain so we can see every cell, whether it's infected or not infected. These are then read on a high content imaging system and analyzed and we're using the Perkin-Elmer operative system for this. This is an example of one of those tests, the fluorescence reduction neutralization test. So we're looking for a dilution of antibody that will result in only half as many red cells as we see in the control that has no antibody. And so for this particular experiment, that turns out to be the one to 160 dilution. Our analysis shows that only half of these cells are infected as compared to those. So the titer of the, in this particular assay is one to 160 of that antibody. We've done a lot of other collaborations using our high content imaging assays, which I won't talk about today, including with other investigators within the NIAID and NIH, but also with outside organizations such as the American Red Cross, the University of Washington. And we're using a similar assay to do antiviral compound screening right now. So as of October, the IRP 
F has screened almost 4,000 total samples from convalescent sera and from our other collaborators. Most of them have very low neutralizing antibody titers, although there are about half of them that have acceptable titers for use in convalescent plasma treatment. Um, and over here, you see the samples we've tested with the titers greater or lesser than 80. The low titered ones are blue, the high titered ones from each individual source are in red. I'm gonna move on now out of the in vitro space into our animal model development work for COVID-19. And our goal was to develop both rodent and non-human primate models that mimic key aspects of human disease and take advantage of the IRF imaging capabilities for relevant COVID-19 countermeasure evaluations. For NHP modeling, we've done several experiments with different delivery methods. In our first experiment, we delivered the virus through interbronchial installation and then did imaging in two separate iterations. In the second experiment, we did intrabronchial installation of the virus plus small particle aerosolization delivery. And in these, we did uh, euthanasia and pathology at day eight. So we were able to determine if the pathological lesions that were seen in the animals were mirrored by the imaging on the live animals. Right now, we're in the middle of a re-exposure experiment of these first animals, which um, is eight months after their initial challenge. And then we developed a hamster model for therapeutic testing studies. For this, the hamsters were given the virus by intranasal administration, and we've done imaging as well. And then I will talk about some studies that we did testing therapeutic antibodies. So for our first non-human primate model, we had three mock infected and three infected crab eating macaques, also known as cinemologous macaques. These are young, healthy animals, three to five years old, probably pretty much like a human teenager. They uh, all got direct interbronchial installation of virus as shown on the left with using a pediatric bronchoscope to directly deposit two mils, two times 10 to the six PFUs per bronchus of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We observed these animals for 30 days and looked for cage side observation of health. We took viral loads in nasal swabs and swabs from other areas. We measured antibody responses, cytokine responses, and then in the subsequent study where we did the euthanasias, we compared histopathology and pathology to our imaging studies that were done here by CT and PET CT. And this is a 3D image of one of the lungs from the animals. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in my next couple of slides. When we look at the uh, disease in these animals, we and everybody else that has tried to develop a non-human primate model finds that they develop very low level disease. Um, they're probably pretty much like a young human where they develop an inapparent disease in most cases. So we really couldn't see anything like fever or shaking or you know anything that would be a clinical sign. The only thing we did see was in transient leukopenia at day two after infection. Measuring antibodies in these three animals, we got three different results um, on each of the three animals by ELISA as in the top graph and by neutralizing antibody assessment using our fluorescence reduction assay on the bottom. One of the animals had high levels of antibodies both by ELISA and by uh, the focus fluorescence reduction assay. The other one in blue had an intermediate antibody response, and then the one in green had very low level response. If we look at how those findings correlate with the viral load in these animals in their nasal swabs, it kind of makes sense. The animal uh, macaque number three in orange with the high levels of antibody had very little virus that could be detected beyond day four in its um, nasal swabs, which is there in blue. The macaque that was in blue in the graph above here with intermediate levels of antibody did have more virus and it lasted longer. And then the antibody with hardly any antibody had the highest levels of um, viral load. 
So if we compare the lungs of these animals shown in each of these great 3D renderings, which was done by Ji Hyun's team, Dr. Marcelo Castro, we see the blue in here are the air are the airways, the red are the vessels, and yellow are lesions that were detected in the lungs by imaging. The gray part is normal lung tissue. So if just looking at one of these in macaque V3, this is the animal that had the most severe disease. This is at day four. What we're seeing here is by the purple arrows, ground glass opacities with air bronchogram in the right posterior lung, essentially meaning that the animals have a um, air filling up in their lungs. And then with the blue arrows, we see ground glass opacities and air bronchogram and consolidation. And that's shown in the blue and the blue. I don't know what these red lines are there. If you see them, uh, they just appeared. I don't know what they are. Um, so for we were also able to do semi-quantitative CT imaging and re read that by our radiologist. He looked at these uh, images from days two through day six, eight, and 12, and came up with the scoring. Um, do, you, do you all see these red lines that keep appearing? Does anybody? Yes. Okay, I, um, do you think I should exit and try to restart? Uh, yeah, I, I Let's see. Don't know I don't know what the, showing. I have yeah. no idea what those are. Or we can just look at red lines, I guess. Okay. That's very weird. So in any case, our radiologists used a score adapted from a human scoring system to come up with a semi-quantitative measure of the lung pathologies. And this is from the three different mechanics. And this, this is the average score shown on the bottom. We also came up, the imaging team came up with a quantitative way to measure the lungs uh, pathology and it's called percent change in lung hyperdensity. They, they select areas of the lung that have been imaged and measure uh, mathematically the lung densities and then come up with a scoring that again shows that the macaque with the most severe disease scores with the highest percent change in lung hyperdensitivity. And then on the right is the average. So the other thing that we're able to do with our imaging is metabolic imaging to determine if there's a metabolic signal associated with the CT structural changes. For this, we use radio-labeled fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a nonspecific marker of increased metabolic activity. In humans, this is used to measure inflammation and is also used to measure tumor, tumor progression and regression in oncology. It gives quantitative data as a standard uptake value or SUV. And some of the results from that are shown here with our same three Connie, macaques. Connie, yes. I think someone touching something and then showing this one keep red right. Would you mind the unshare and the reshare again? I can do that. Yeah. Maybe. Stop share. Goody, went away. That's yes. great, thank you. Let's go back to my mode. So I was saying we're using a metabolic labeling to get a better idea of uh, where metabolic changes might correlate with the imaging that we saw. And this will be with a scale over here on the right, the SUV scale that I've already mentioned, the standard uptake value. So with the purple arrows, this is the animal that had the fewest lesions on the top by uh, CT imaging, but you can see some increased FTG signal in the lymph nodes. And obviously the other two animals have much more severe metabolic changes. The yellow and the red are the most severe. And we can see in those animals, a lot of uh, uptake of the radio labeled 
chlorodeoxyglucose. So to summarize that model, similar to other labs, we've observed mild to moderate non-lethal disease in the non-human primates. The viral loads, viral distribution, and immune responses observed are similar to reports from other labs. The CT and PET imaging enhanced the model by demonstrating qualitative CT assessments that mimic human disease, quantitative CT assessments corresponding to the histopathology, metabolic activities on PET corresponding to CT lung lesions, FDG PET indicating areas of inflammation, and I didn't show histopathology, but our histopathology findings also support the radiologic findings. So our conclusion is that using this imaging, the radiological assessments do have the potential to enhance countermeasure evaluation in real time on live animals without having to do serial sacrifice to look at the pathology within these animals. Moving on then to our small animal model, golden Syrian hamsters. These animals have more pronounced disease than other laboratory animals tested, including non-human primates, ferrets, mice, pigs, and cats. Clinical signs of disease include primarily weight loss, lethargy, ruffled fur, hunched posture, and rapid or shallow breathing. High viral RNA can be detected in lung and nasal washes, and the respiratory tract histopathology reflects findings that are seen also in human disease with a lot of lung pathology. An immune response does mimic some aspects of COVID-19. However, this is still a non-lethal model. So the primary measure of disease in these animals is over the first week after infection. The black line here shows uh, six week old hamsters over those time. And since they're essentially young, baby hamsters, they are gaining weight over this time period. Our infected hamsters that got either a low dose or a high dose of SARS-CoV-2 not only don't gain weight, they actually lose weight up to 10% of their body weight. Old hamsters, like old humans, fare even worse. On um, the black, since these are adult old hamsters, they're not expected to gain weight, but their weight does remain constant. But when they're infected with SARS-CoV-2, they can lose up to 20% of their body weight. These animals the, have a high level of virus found at, as early as day two and extending out through day eight, both in their nasal washings as well as in their lungs. If we look at the pathology, on the left, the control lung looks very nice. The bottom lung, you can clearly see a lot of lesions and inflammation. And this can be measured. It's a growth pathology score by our pathologist showing that it peaks at day five with both the high and low dose of virus, then begins to resolve by day eight. And shown on the right on the top is a control lung with a lot of airspace, a lot of open space. That's what a lung should like, look like. On the bottom by histopathology, you see many infiltrates and congestion in the lung. So what we can show here is that from mock infected to infected at day two to day eight, we see the worst pathology at day five beginning to resolve by day eight. That also corresponds with what we see by histopathology, starting with congestion on day two, peaking at day five and starting to resolve by day eight. This also corresponds to what we have seen and what I've already described somewhat with our CT imaging. So shown here is a really cool video that our imaging team took of uh, a lesion in hamsters starting at baseline and moving up through day eight, showing the progression of the lesion. Uh, this is from baseline to day five, and then from day five to day eight will be coming up shortly. And again, when you start seeing the yellow development which you will shortly hear by day five. Um, this is a severe lesion is indicated by this SUV max scale. You can also see it on this graph on the right, day two peaking at day five, starting to resolve by day eight. So the final thing I want to talk to you about today is how we can use these models to do something actually useful. And the study I'm going to talk about is something that is done with, as a collaboration with the Department of Defense 
through Operation Warp Speed, which is a public-private partnership initiated by the U.S. government to facilitate and accelerate development, manufacturing, and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Many agencies with the US, within the U.S. government participate in Operation Warp Speed, including us at the National Institute of Health and the Department of Defense. For the studies that I'm going to describe very briefly, we're working with another part of NIAID, with um, BARDA, and with the Health and Human Services, and with the D Department of Defense. The IRF investigators involved are shown here, and those from USAMRIT are shown here. So in this study, what we are doing is taking many antibodies that are already in clinical trials in humans and comparing their protective efficacy in, in hamsters in side-by-side -side experiments. This is a way to tell which of these antibodies, how they compare to each other in a single system. And I noticed that Dr. G mentioned Celtrion. That's one of the ones we're working, working on, as well as two Lilly products, a single monoclonal antibody and a double monoclonal antibody cocktail. So how this works is the companies send their antibodies first to us here at the IRF. We use our fluorescence reduction neutralization assay to compare their neutralizing activity in vitro. And on this scale, you see the percent neutralization on the y-axis and on the excess, so it's the concentration of the antibodies. So all of those that are here to the left take less antibody to reach 100% neutralization. The ones on the right take a lot more antibody before they get to 100% neutralization. I, our study design is that we're doing two treatment conditions, a prophylactic one where we give the antibodies 24 hours before infection and a therapeutic one where we give the antibodies eight hours after infection uh, by interperitoneal injection into the hamsters. Each of the antibodies is tested at 10 milligrams per kilogram in a group of 12 hamsters. And in a second group of 12 hamsters, each antibody is compared at the dose that the company chooses that they'd like it tested at, which is usually higher than 10 milligrams per kilogram. The, we give the virus by intranasal exposure, and this is just a study designed for the minus 24 hour study where antibody is given 24 hours before infection, and then we weigh the animals every day, collect or, or pharyngeal swabs every other day, and do complete necropsies at the end of the experiment. I'm only gonna show the results for the first three that we've tested at the IRF. And these blue and orange lines are the control animals in each graph. They are losing weight after infection. Those that are treated with the antibodies are the green, which is a 10 milligram per kilogram dose and the higher dose that the company selected in red. And then the control that was not uh, given anything is in purple. So you can see those that are treated with the antibody, at least for test article one and three are just as good as if they hadn't been infected at all, showing they work really well. Test article two is not quite as good, but it's still clearly more protective than um, those that were not given the antibody products. So all three of these were, met our criteria to move on to the therapeutic study, which is in progress right now. Another thing we do in collaboration with USAMRID is to measure gross pathology scores. The, our pathologists are using the same scoring criteria. And what you can see on these, on these graphs, again, the red and the green are the treated antibodies that at day three, you can see these two, there's absolutely no pathological scoring, a little bit on uh, day seven. With this particular antibody, the uh, lower dose, the 10 milligram per kilogram isn't that great, but it's still better than the controls. But the higher dose, the company selected dose, completely protected from pathological lesions. And then finally, test article three was great at both doses at both days. And again, here's a normal lung compared to an infected lung on the right. So to summarize what we've got so far with this collaborative study, it is a study of both pro prophylactic and therapeutic efficacy of human antibody products that are already in the clinic. And it initiated this study through Operation Warp Speed. 
the NIAID IRF and USAMRID collaborating to test the products, both prophylactically and therapeutically. Both labs are using the same methods, virus stocks, assay procedures, source of hamsters, and scoring criteria to evaluate the products. The NIAID IRF is comparing the neutralizing activity of all samples, and USAMRID is performing QRT-PCR on all of the samples collected at both sites. A common pathology scoring sheet was developed and is being implemented at the sites, and we're, our pathologists are planning to exchange samples to confirm these findings. And we have weekly calls conducted to report progress, develop plans, and address problems. This has been an excellent collaboration, and I think it'll be valuable data. Even though these antibodies are already all in the clinic, there's no way to compare them side by side in humans. So uh, this will at least give some idea of how they compare to one another. So with that, I'm gonna end and acknowledge first the people that were key at the IRF in developing the in vitro assays, Mike Holbrook, Elena Posnikova, Imaging, Ji Hyun Lee and Erwin Feuerstein, veterinary staff, Marissa St. Clair and Russ Byram, pathology, Lou Hazella, Tim Cooper, the hamster model, Yu Kong and Reed Johnson, NHP model, Courtney Finch, Jens Kuhn, Ian Crozier, and these beautiful EM pictures that I've been showing throughout are done by our electron microscopist, John Birnbaum. And there are of course many, many more people to acknowledge at the IRF, which I don't have time to name, but they are shown here. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for paying attention and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Schmalgen, for your informative talk. Uh, I enjoyed very much for your inspirational talks from you as well as Dr. G. And thank you both of you again for enlightening us about COVID-19. Now we will have a Q&A session for both speakers and this session will be run by today's moderator, Dr. Park. Dr. Eun-jung Park received her PhD in genetics at MIT and went through postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School and currently a program officer at the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, NIAID, NIH. She manages a portfolio of grants and contracts concerning RNA viruses, including animal coronaviruses, piconaviruses, paramexoviruses. Dr. Park, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. You can hear me, right? Yes. So uh, we have a very, it's just, just fabulous talks and thank you so much. So um, I will go to the specific questions being asked first and I'm hoping to get some uh, at the end, uh, the ways to maybe setting up collaboration between two countries. So the first two question is going to Dr. G um, asking when uh, when Korean uh, diagnostics been uh, uh, developed? Uh, when 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 did you get the COVID nineteen sequence so that this uh, test been developed? This is from Anna McClung. So um. When China uh, CDC released the sequence, uh, I think it was uh, around the 13th of January, that has been shared with everyone, I, I suppose. So we also uh, were able to get that sequence. And when uh, after we got that sequence, we had a meeting on January 27th with the pharmaceutical companies and asking them to produce the, uh, the kits based on that sequence. And we promised uh, emergency use authorization once they are, they, they are ready. So that has been done uh, early February. So that was really very fast. So I, okay. I don't know if that, that, kit, that answers the question. Yeah, so I think the, the you got the sequence from uh, Chinese CDC when that yeah, sequence yeah. been published. Okay, so next question is from John Hammond asking, there's a high degree of surface contamination where that was examined, but how much infection is now thought to occur as a result of surface contamination? It's also for Dr. G. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so actually that's the uh, comparison of air samples and uh, surface uh, samples. 
from a room state uh, which the patient state. So I, I think they just try to see how uh, risky those uh, the surface uh, um, contamination could be. But as a as a, uh, a result, it I mean it. it Really didn't lead to any any uh, further infection. It's just for the for the study to, to compare which would be more important, which which is um, air samples on surface samples. So it didn't lead to uh, any um, further spread from that surface contamination. But it's just giving some warning that we should be more careful with the surface uh, contamination in general, but I suppose uh, if you really want to see the infectivity, we should also do the um, culture, but I don't think they, they actually did the culture, but um, the from the PCR, it just is, they couldn't really see any uh, positive from air samples. So that's just for the comparison rather than a real world situation. Thank you. And there are some other questions to Dr. G, but it's more related to the, the mechanics. So I will concentrate on scientific question first. So I think it's for you, Connie. Is there a reason uh, only choose SARS-CoV uh, and MP protein instead of not spikes or live protein, live virus for uh, the new assay? Yes, the, this was an assay that we'd already developed using SARS-1, and we had that antibody present and found that it worked really well for detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2. So we didn't really look for a different antibody to move forward with that. Uh, another question to you, Connie, this is from me actually. Um, is there's a couple of questions, what, I mean, few questions. <laughs> So in in your um, in your the NHP experiment, there are three monkeys, and uh, when you look at the antibody level at day twelve, they show start showing up. But um, the the so but you can see at day five, they're already showing the the. So so the question is that. Uh, is there some innate immunity uh, aspects more than than uh, adaptive immune response for their monkey differences? And also, those monkeys, like most of your monkeys, two out of three more or less, didn't develop neutralizing antibody, yet they resolve the the infection. So, what is your uh, your take on that? Okay. Well, two out of three had good levels of neutralizing antibodies in that experiment. That I only showed the first iteration of that as well. But I should have pointed out at the bottom of my slides, there's a reference to a paper that was published, we published in May, that has all of the cytokine data in it, including the interferon responses of these animals. And you're right, there is a, a lot of differences in the innate immunity that can be measured. As for that one animal that um, didn't show a lot of disease and didn't have a lot of antibodies. It's just like people, it seems to me. And because we're noticing in patients that if you don't have a very robust infection, you also don't have a robust immune response. So it's probably, um, whether it's a low level infection or whether it's um, the animal is somehow able to fight it off without getting really infected, maybe a pre-existing type of immunity or something like that, or even innate immunity. Um, I don't have an answer for knowing it, but it, it's interesting that it is similar to what we see in people. Um, another question. Uh, uh, one other question about the, you have a, this uh, setting of this uh, plasma 1 to 80 as a cutoff between high and low, and what was the basis of uh, thinking that's the case? Well, for our experiments, we're doing the initial screening, and then if they're over 1 to 80, they're at, the people are asked to come back to give blood in larger quantities later, and there's too much of a drop in, in tighter over the couple of weeks it takes to get the, them back to do that. So if you start at 1 to 40, 
by the time they come back, their titer is going to be one to 20 or less. So 80 we found was the absolute minimum you could do and still get something with a decent neutralizing titer in a larger quantity. So that's not because uh, that is a protective level, the correlative we, protection. No, we don't know that. Yeah. So I have uh, people using mouse adapted uh, COVID-2 or I mean SARS-CoV-2 or uh, you know ACE model that have uh, correlative protection levels of uh, plasma has been uh, done. There. I don't know of those studies. It's possible they have. Uh, we are planning to start, we're getting some uh, transgenic human ACE2 hamsters here at the IRF that we're going to be doing some of those kinds of studies in, yeah. but we haven't done them yet. So why did you do uh, intrabronchial infection when you could do aerosol I mean, uh, generation? So because that's the, you know. Right. Back when we did this in March, the only non-human primate models that had been published so far were at Rocky Mountain Laboratories, the other NIAID IRF in Montana, and they were doing several routes of inoculation. We thought that we would try something different, which is to put the lung deep, put the virus deep in the lungs where all of the pathology is seen, thinking that we might be able to induce a stronger infection. Well, it wasn't really any stronger than what was seen by the other routes. So in our second experiment, we did both that and small particle aerosolization. So the animals got aerosolized virus as well as the instilled virus. In an upcoming study, we're going to be doing large particle aerosolization, which we nobody else has done that yet to see if that will um, put it in the upper respiratory tract as it is in humans. That's how we get it and uh, perhaps induce a better. Uh, I think part of the problem though, is these are just young, healthy animals. If we had some really old guys hanging yeah. out there, we do have a project with a collaborator that's going to be have an induced obesity coming up to try to mimic that aspect of human disease. So there are a bunch of questions. Uh, I really like to get into uh, the way to you know collaborate and how people can use the, the both NIH and uh, the Korean facilities. So, Doc, the Connie and Dr. G, can you stay a little bit, little bit, little bit longer? Is sure. Possible? What about you, Dr. G? Can you stay a little longer? Yeah. Okay. So good. So there's then I will go through some other questions. Anna, um, I, I will go to Songil Moon. So asking Dr. G, a month ago, Korea has issued the vaccine confidence of flu. What do you think about how Korean government can overcome this issue? And what is the plan for COVID uh, vaccine distribution to incre increase vaccine confidence in Korea? And what kind of COVID vaccine will import it to Korea except AstraZeneca? Um, so, uh uh, we do have a Korean advisory group for immunization, um, like other countries, so that there has been continuous discussion on this issue for the flu. Uh, and we believe same situation can also happen with COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, I think that pro the, the primary uh, problem was from the media, the media's uh, attitude, how to report this kind of news. and. That really uh, was a big problem initially. Then we tried to really explain, and uh, based on the discussion among the expert group, we we did get briefing from um, from the result of the investigation. So we're quite confident about the vaccine. So we uh, um, uh, the government tried to 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 explain uh, the, all the situation continuously, but with COVID nineteen vaccine. Um, with safety issue and um, this is even, it, it can be even more difficult than flu vaccine, which has been used for a long time. So we are emphasizing the, the risk communication uh, with the public uh, regarding COVID-19 vaccines. The government is going to um, uh, soon finalize the, the, the national COVID-19 vaccine plan and uh, announce to, to the public. And uh, so hopefully with, with 
those um, communication with the public, the, the, um, the public can have the confidence <laughs> in vaccination. And uh, apart from AstraZeneca vaccine, I think there are several, um, not several, maybe few vaccines uh, under um, discussion. Uh, I think some of the MRA vaccine are also included, maybe some other um, uh, protein vaccine, protein-based uh, protein vaccine, but um, that I think that will be probably announced uh, within a week or two. But um, I'm not supposed to tell the, all the, <laughs> those stories as a member of uh, advisory group for, for the government. So, so let's just wait and see. Okay, great. Um, so the other questions are relating to the uh, question of, I think it's a question is from uh, the other young Miji. I think he's asking um, the the funding going to right uh, fund from Gates. How how that's been like? How this foreign uh, fund get distributed to support Korean R and D? So actually, that has been proposed by the Gates because there is a model existing model in Japan called GHIP model. So that was proposal from Gates uh, through IVI. So IVI has good, good collaboration with Gates. So Gates uh, uh, forwarded the idea to IVI. And as uh, I was a member of board of, of trustee for IVI. So uh, director general of IVI gave that idea to me. Then I forwarded the idea to the Ministry of Health and that's how it uh, um, started. So um, that's the, that was a proposal from the gates from the beginning. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So the, the next uh, some kind of confidence in the uh, in in some of those health industry in in Korea. Great. Uh, so the next part of the question is about um, how how the somebody who has a candidate drugs, for example can be supported by Korean government. So I, I think the uh, Kim Jong-woo from uh, asking, Bioware Bio, Bio is asking, he, he has an um, uh, anti-polymerase inhibitor, which is not um, monoclonal antibody or the repurposed drug. And he has a good candidate and how can, uh, for, he can get supported by Korean government to develop this drug? Um, I think he has to continuously uh, see those announcements from the government. I, I, I don't really know what um, other ways to, to really approach the government project. Um, um, maybe try to do some seminar here. <laughs> <laughs> So, but other than official route, I don't really know how to how to really approach the government. Okay, and maybe there should be some, should be yeah. some publication, maybe also. Okay, so I think that segue to question about Kani, that how can people use IRF for their research? Is there a I think you mentioned in the in the link, but if you can just briefly go over. Right. But how all of our projects are developed is a uh, scientist at the IRF and an extramural partner, it could be any of you, would talk to each other and write a short concept proposal about what they would like to do. This is then reviewed at our meeting, which we call our, our um, PCG group. It meets every Wednesday. We review proposals and we decide at that group here at the IRF, is this something that fits in our mission? Is this something we have the resources to support? And is it scientifically interesting? And if we say yes, and it's funded already by the NIH, the US NIH, then that's done. We can go ahead and do it. If it's from an outside organization, such as one of your organizations that is not at US NIH, it goes on to a second review by our scientific steering committee at the NIH for 
for actual approval. So everything is a collaborative project. We don't do investigator-driven research here. Our job is to facilitate other people's research, which is way different than intramural investigators for NIH. Now these animal model developments we did without partners mostly because we call those our toolbox projects. We have to have a model before we can test anything in it with a partner. So we can do things like that, but we really don't do research projects without a partner. And there will be a list of scientists in each of the different areas on our website. So if you're interested in aerobiology, there'll be a person there you can contact to talk to about it. But if you just have an idea and don't wanna look at the website, contact me and I'll point you in the right direction. Yeah, so um, this is made, I, I will just make a comment. So, so so NIH and even NIID, which is a big, you know, big uh, institute. And so I am at the um, extramural division, which means that we support research, the extramural community. And we, we, we not only provide funding to do research that include US and non-US scientists, but also we have a contract mechanism so if you have a pen interesting compound that you want to evaluate, we have a in vitro models, we have a in vivo models that we contracted out, they were tested. For example, this one of the, uh, our contractor made uh, the, the transgenic hamster, for example. And mm -hmm. also we have a preclinical and the toxic studies, PK studies, uh, we have a ways to synthesize compounds. We, we can, it's very rare, but we can do GMP. And also we have a clinical trial network that we do. So some the, the current uh, vaccine trials use NIID uh, clinical trial network. So those are the possibilities. So unlike uh, IRF where Connie is in our case, um, you don't have to have NIH funding for that. Anybody who can uh, ask. So if they have a question, again, we have a, on our website, it's well listed, but sometimes it's harder to find. So if you have a, a program or a plan, then you can contact me, then I will also direct you to the right place. So there's another question before I get into the real collaboration type. There's a Young Miji asking, there are clinical trials for vaccine and therapeutics for COVID-19 in Korea. How Korean government support or involved in these trials? It's for Dr. Okay. G. So um, I think government uh, designated some of the hospitals for the clinical trials as a clinical trial network. Uh, also supporting some of those uh, um, clinical trials for, for the vaccine and therapeutics. And uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, government established the, the task force team for, for, the, um, for three areas, vaccine and therapeutics and, and medical equipment. So they will probably review those um, uh, candidates and, and follow up um, in those, uh, um, among those TF members. And uh, government is supporting some of the uh, the trials, not all, but um, most promising ones, I think the government is supporting, providing some funding. That will continue, I think. Um, so so the, I have a question for you, Dr. G. I mean, in terms of the One Health uh, program. So you mentioned about, um, uh, you know, in, emerging infections, including as, as, as TSV, but uh, what about some other emerging infections? For example, you know, Connie worked on antivirus. I think uh, Yanagihara showed that the shrews in near DMG has a antivirus and so on. So do, you, do they have a program, for example, surveying, you know, bats or tick, a lot of tick-borne virus like uh, SSTB, SSB is a tick-borne uh, viruses. So is there a program to surveying what potential pathogens might, it might emerge from uh, Korean wildlife? Uh, I just uh, 
uh, listed SFTS as one example because that has quite high mortality and is emerging path pathogen in China, Korea, and Japan uh, quite recently. It's, so it has been a big problem in Korea uh, as well as in China and Japan. So I just list it as an ex example, but for other pathogens, of course, we have a uh, um, hunter virus and that's kind of endemic here. Yeah? It's not really that widespread, but still uh, it's happening uh, all the time. So we do have research on that area as well. So, yeah. so then you, also, you do actually I'm survey, I'm survey I'm potential I'm pathogens uh, in wild animals. Well, that will be in, in collaboration with other ministries, uh, like mm -hmm. uh, ministries. Uh, we do have some environmental uh, Ministry of Environment. So they also we, so for that actually um, we want to launch. So another area we have to launch as a government wide the project is genetic diseases. We were trying to do that several years ago. For now, I think it's time for us to really launch another uh, government wide um, project. That it, that will be a genetic disease, genetic infectious diseases. I think so. We are partly doing those uh, um, uh, survey among animals, wild animals, and dom um, and, um, and domestic animals as well. So I, I mean the, the, the pets, but um, I think we really really have to work together to really uh, tackle this issue. Great. So I think <laughs> so. We're just really getting too late, but. I, I believe that there's a good uh, MOU between Korea and NIH. I think the TB program has worked really well. I think Cliff Lane uh, and some other people for NIH does great work with TB. And you mentioned the MERS uh, antibody, but how do you think you and Connie, I'm asking you to both, how do you think that uh, ways to collaborate, of course, that this kind of forum will help because people know each other and so on, and we can redistribute the participant list. But what, how you think we could move this forward? Because uh, I think both uh, countries can gain a lot of insight. I try to help uh, uh, bring some uh, MERS strains from Korean CDC, but that has been a little bit difficult, for example. So, you know, what, how can we do make this uh, collaboration more functional? So, well, um, after MERS outbreak in Korea, there has been quite good, good collaboration, as I mentioned. And also, um, we were uh, organizing the bilateral symposium between US NIH and Korea NIH. That I think happened uh, probably twice. And uh, next time was actually um, April this year, I think. Then because of COVID-19, it cannot, not this the next year, next April, but probably because of COVID-19, that cannot, cannot be <laughs> organized, but it, there is a mechanism. So um, the, the other, the, the other uh, thing I have to mention is that there are Many institutions which wants to collaborate with the US NIH under under the Ministry of Science and ICT, but current um, MOU is between two NIH, US and Korea. So those other institutions under the Ministry of Science and ICT also need to work together with the uh, Korea NIH to make just one group. And the next plan for the April meeting in in US was uh, actually. To, to have all those uh, institutions uh, represented in that um, bilateral symposium. So that was the idea initially, but because of this the COVID-19 problem, it, it, we couldn't go ahead any uh, anything, but um, uh, once things are resolved, then we should really have all um, the relevant institutions can participate in this collaboration with USNIH. Then uh, maybe we can start from some online online meeting, uh, starting from next year. The another another uh, one a uh, lot of countries do is uh, bilateral agreement. So like uh, um, there's a U.S. U.S. China program, U.S. Brazil program, U.S. India program. Now I think they're setting up U.S. Uh, uh, 
even Finland program. So something like that, uh, you you know, Korean government to, could consider uh, and contact NIH because what that does is that uh, Korean government to provide some the money to the Korean scientists and U.S. Uh, government provide U.S. scientists, but they make a joint proposal reviewed by uh, NIH uh, review group. But when it is is it ranked, two countries ranked, and then you kind of uh, match. So the highest priority for both countries get funded, but funding comes from individual governments. So U.S. People will get U.S. money. The the other countries uh, people get other countries money. I think that might be one another way. Yeah. Pani, do you have a? We have well, a I, I think you are both right. Meeting in person is really the best way to set up friendships and collaborations. But if there was some way to provide a list of funding opportunities that could be applied for by partners. Um, people that know each other could do that. When I was at USAMRID, we had a partnership, um, a grant in which we brought several Korean scientists over to our genomics center to do deep sequencing of hantavirus isolates that they collected throughout Korea. And that was a GEIS uh, geograph, what is that global, you know what GEIS is, I forget what it stands for, but it was a grant that they wrote together. So when these opportunities come up, if if the Korean scientists and you, you're in the perfect place in trying to figure this out, what is available for people to apply for that fits within our interest area? Now us, in my, my uh, laboratory, we cannot take money from the outside. We are fully okay. funded by the US government. So that's what I said in my talk. If, if we have a partnership and a project that's of interest, we pay for the whole thing other than the purchase of animals. Um, we ask the partner to buy the animals for the study. Yeah, so another thing that we do uh, NIID is we have a, this US Japan program has been going on more than 50 years now. And we, that got, focus got changed from US Japan to uh, Pacific Rim. And we having meetings every, other like a vir viral disease meeting one year and bacterial par parasitology meeting. And it happened IBI one year uh, with the bacteriology uh, part of the meeting. And I have been trying to disseminate this information to Korean scientists and I was not very successful. I really did my best. I contacted everyone I know of to uh, the announced this program, but maybe uh, someone listening to he, the talk today from Korea, you know, could help me to disseminate this meeting because it is a good meeting. That's where you can meet the scientists from US and the regional as well as European because we really try to invite the best of them. And we just had a meeting in Bangkok and I tried to, to invite a lot of people uh, participating uh, from Korea ecosystem, the registration is free, but I have been difficulty uh, so far. So someone can help me to disseminate, disseminate the information, that would be great. I think we kind of uh, exhausted, uh, let's see. Uh, um, so there's one other question I just, it just came. Uh, the could a U.S.-based company receive a grant from Korean government for COVID-19 related R&D? Uh, if yes, what is the eligibility criteria? So I, I uh, actually tried to answer the question. The you need to have a Korean partner. Oh yeah, so you did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it was you. Okay. And, in fact, in fact, actually, uh, regarding the collaboration, uh, uh, we used to have such program. We have sent some people to US NIH, uh, to different programs, including MERS, uh, the VRC, and also genomic science. So that there was a program, I think that program has ended. So maybe try to have another one um, get, getting started. So um, 
it used to be uh, such program in the past. Yeah. Until, uh, so, yeah. 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 Perhaps making, you know, as you mentioned, that bilateral program might be a good one to start with, mm -hmm. and having people more get um, more making connections. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can I can talk to you offline if you're interested. In. Okay, so I think with that uh, concludes the, our successful meeting, and I I thank everybody. Just you know, staying late is almost nine o'clock uh, p.m. in U.S. And so thank you so much. And again, thank you for Connie and Dr. G for participating in this exciting meeting, and also for the organizers. Thank you, and have a good night and day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.